Tide Podcast. Here we go. Hello, hello, around the block and around the world. This is where we discuss, debate, and deliberate all things diabetes. Representing type two from the land of cheese, Wisconsin. My name is Dobie Maxwell, representing type one, the vivacious, effervescent, and always in the know, Ms. Sammy Parker. But first, today's episode of Just My Type is brought to you by the Diabetes App, a free social community app that brings together both type one and type two diabetics, plus their supporters. Find community, resources, Sammy and me, and cheese on the Diabetes app. Hey, Sammy. Hey, Dobie. How are you? Don't know why I'm in a dairy mood today. I know you're in California, but California has overtaken Wisconsin as the dairy state. Did you know that? Plant-based dairy, you mean? No, I'm jealous. Cows, cheese, milk, butter, everything that I like and you don't. Never. What's the cheese of the day, Dobie? The cheese of the day is mozzarella, only because I think it's a funny word. We are delighted, distinguished, and honored to welcome what is officially known as a big cheese, Sammy, in the diabetes (laughs) business. What is that called? This is a a sister of a very good friend of mine from the Chicago area. She is in Washington, D.C. She is an endocrinologist, and uh, she knows a lot about diabetes. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Domenica Rubino. Dr. Rubino, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. How are you all doing this morning? Well, it it couldn't be any better because uh, you are going to educate us. We try to educate, entertain, and engage, and you you know a lot of stuff. And uh, Sammy, I'll let you take it over because I don't know where to start asking. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think as a type one, I've had it now for nine years. So I have a lot of it in my back pocket. And my undergraduate was in exercise science and I'm in a master's for exercise science. So I feel like I have a lot of background in it, but it's still different than hearing an endocrinologist talk about it really. And honestly, like be able to emphasize the complications of it because I think at times since we deal with it 24 seven, it's like, oh, my blood sugar is just high. It's fine. Versus like actually recognizing, okay, like what actually can take place and happen. So I think it could be really interesting if you maybe just share even some of this most serious complications that occur. And also kind of if you have any stories and whatnot about how you kind of got into this field in the first place and just What are complications that people need to really pay attention to for both type one and type two? Okay. Well, I think generally complications to understand about diabetes uh, independent of whether you have type one or type two largely have to do with not having your blood sugars regulated, right? And when you have extra sugar running around in your system, it can cause damage to certain tissues. And some tissues in particular are more vulnerable. Like most people do know about the eyes. The eyes are fairly vulnerable in terms of hyperglycemia, so you can get some changes in the blood vessels in particular. I think what people don't realize is that with high blood sugar, you also get inflammation. So you're looking at not just the high blood sugar, but resulting inflammation. So impacting eyes, impacting kidneys, can impact the nervous system in terms of circulation, also impacts the heart. And so because of that, some of the major things that most people know about are what can happen. You can have a stroke. You're at greater risk for having heart disease, having a heart attack earlier. You can get decreased blood flow to various parts, including the kidneys with some resulting damage, hands and feet, et cetera. So there's some of these bigger sort of systemic effects. And some of that's probably uh, dictated from some genetics. Some, you're, mm-hmm. some people are going to be at greater risk than others for the consequences and the complications. However, the good part is mitigating or decreasing that risk can largely be in your hands by taking good care, which I know you guys are talking about all the time, exercise, weight loss, all of those things can really make a big difference in the management of your blood sugar and decreasing your risk. Now, you are an an expert in the the field of weight loss. And I think in America, in general, I know around the world, but especially in America, we need to uh, drop some LBs, don't you think? Yeah, it's a big problem. And it, I mean, there's like 70 million people in our country that are overweight. That's very shocking. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> I live in Wisconsin, so all of them are there. Well, yeah, it may be different. I mean, it, it's clearly different in different regions of the country, right? But if you think about it, like if you look at stuff from maybe 30 years ago, everything's changed, right? Our portions have changed. If you look at a sandwich from back in like the 1970s, very early 80s, it's a relatively small sandwich. You look at a sandwich now and you go to a restaurant, it's 1,200 calories. And a sandwich from many years ago would be more like 400 calories. Our portions are bigger. And it's not just when people talk about fast food, but look at coffee. I mean, Dobie, maybe you're not the same age. We're old enough to realize, do you remember when you used to get a styrofoam cup of coffee at a meeting? 
and it was six ounces, right? But it felt normal in your hands. Mm -hmm. But now we're used to getting coffee out where 12 ounces isn't enough, right? We need our 20 ounce latte to get through the day. So just portions alone have changed and we don't move as much. We just don't move. I mean, I come from an era where people rolled the window down. You got up to change the channel. Sure. There were only, you know, five channels, not a thousand channels. And we sit in our couch and we have our drink holder <laughs> and we eat and we watch TV and we binge. We don't even get up to do things, right? So our day-to-day movement is less and the portions are more. And that alone in our environment has made a tremendous change and a tremendous risk. Dr. Rubino, would you say that fast food is, to me, was a treat when I was a kid. Maybe you go on your birthday, maybe three or four times a year. Absolutely. And now people are going four or five times a week in Sammy's generation. No offense to you, Sammy. I know you don't. I don't even think I've ever had. (laughs) Here comes the revelation. Never had fast food. I've never even had fast food. I mean, I guess if you count in and out back in the day, like I haven't, when I wasn't plant-based, I would eat. But it wasn't all the time. Like my family was just not a fast food family. Right. For those not in California, in and out is a hamburger place. Exactly. The rest of the question on the other side. Of yeah, the sorry. Thing. Sorry. In and out's a hamburger place. But it's interesting because like the only fast food, honestly, ever was when we went to my great grandma's house and we'd stop on the way because she loved a Taco Bell burrito. Mm-hmm. And so we get like the kids right. bean rice and cheese taco. But like that was like the worst thing I had. Like I never even like went to McDonald's. It was either for Diet Coke, but not for like food. I think the thing is, it's become normalized. And to Dobie's point, there are a lot of kids that are growing up where three, four, five times, even if they're doing sports, right? How they're eating is everyone's on the fly. Everyone's yes. grabbing food, eating fast. Yeah. No one's cooking. No. no one sits down to eat. And so when you eat fast and you eat food that's very calorie dense, like fast food, meaning you know, a few bites, it's a lot of calories as opposed to, you know, Sammy, your plant-based diet, which is a lot more volume, right? You have to actually chew a lot more to get the same amount of calories. I feel like I'm eating, my family will be like, you just never stop eating. And I'm like, (laughs) well, I just, I can eat. And they're like, Smith, you've eaten like twice as much as us. I'm like, I know, but it's all plants. (laughs) Exactly. So, I mean, the thing is, is that calorie dense types of food, which is what you get when something's really fast. Yeah. And also most of us are tired when we go through fast food, right? Mm -hmm. So you're tired, you're going to be more vulnerable, you're going to eat more. Um, And most people even who get takeout, like all during COVID, people would were kind of at home, but a lot of times they were getting some food deliveries. When you're at home and you get takeout, you're most likely going to finish more of it than if you were cooking and you're packing some of it up, things are sort of spread out. So the amount of calories we get used to, we we eat a lot. Yeah, and I think that's what's even more interesting too. I was in my like one of my last classes I took at um, Pepperdine for my undergrad. It was exercise, health, and disease, and like huge chunk was on diabetes. And we talked about type one, but it's so hard because even though well, I have a different view. I don't look at it as like the standard, like just take the medication. I'm like over there, like exercise and nutrition does play a role in type one too. But specifically on type two, we are focusing on and like the weight loss and how that impacts insulin sensitivity. But it's so crazy because I think the issue with it now too is people go on like diets. And so then they do lose the weight and they're more insulin sensitive. They're not having like as much excess fat, but then it's so easy because obviously the little fatty tissues aren't really going away. So then it's like the second they go off the fad diet, then they just gain all the weight back. And it's like, you're going exactly where you're at and then probably, and then some. And so I think it's such like a vicious cycle for type two specifically for those that follow a diet. I think what you bring up is a really important point, regardless of whether somebody has diabetes or they have pre-diabetes or they have no diabetes at all and they happen to be listening, is that your body is going to protect the weight. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult. I think a lot of people don't understand that. They think in some ways your your body, your brain is almost like a computer that says, oh, okay, my blood pressure's up, my sugar's up. Let me let a little weight off. It doesn't do that. What happens is you lose weight And all kinds of warning signals come from the muscle cells, the fat cells, all over your body. The brain is getting feedback that you're, you know, it's like May Day, you're losing weight. Mm -hmm. So the body wants to hold on to weight. So what happens after you start to lose weight is you start to get hungrier and you're not as full. And so those things start driving you to eat again. So that's one of the reasons why it's not only hard to lose weight, but if you're successful at losing weight, difficult to maintain. 
because not only does your appetite go up, you don't feel as full as you did before, but to really top it all off, you don't burn as many calories as you used to. Yeah. And so you may think that you're burning all these calories. However, there's something called metabolic adaptation, which means your body adapts the metabolism. One of the reasons why we get colder, if we decrease our calories, to burn less so that the body can try to make up for it. And you're absolutely right. You not only go to the previous weight, but you actually end up higher each time. And most people have experienced How tricky it. is that? It's obnoxious. It is. It's really obnoxious. I would have called the factory. <laughs> Doby, it would be like, for example, like, so you're like, okay, I weigh X, Y, Z, and now I'm going to try to weigh A, B, C. Mm-hmm. And so you lose weight and you're at A, B, C, and it's, you were eating really healthy and whatnot. Now your resting metabolic rate lowers. And then you're like, mm, I'm at the weight I'm at now. So I'm going to take that let's see, what do you like? Yogurt and granola and maybe the piece of toast with a whopping scoop of Skippy peanut butter. And (laughs) you load it up, but then you're like, well, I'm thin. So what? I can start eating more. But then it's like your resting metabolic rate is still lower and now you're eating though more. So you think like I can eat- storm. Yeah. I guess I probably shouldn't tell you. I'm I'm always uh, uh, trying to improve and I'm trying to get down to uh, my birth weight, eight pounds, six ounces. (laughs) That's oh my to gosh, you to. should have told me. I would have done it My metabolism you. needs to speed up a little bit. <laughs> you better skip the Skippy peanut butter. Yeah. It's not for that. <laughs> the diet peanut butter. Dr. Rubino, what made you get to be an, an endocrinologist? You don't have diabetes yourself, do you? Uh, no, I don't. Actually, what really interested me about endocrinology is I really became interested in how hormones affect behavior, mm-hmm. how it impacts psychology. What I did originally was work a lot with premenstrual syndrome and how women felt during sort of these hormonal mm-hmm. changes. And it was always very profound to me how given a certain hormonal circumstance, you might feel differently, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happened was I got involved. I did research for a long time, basic science research in cancer and how estrogen receptor works. And then I went out and started working, directing um, an obesity program in terms of clinical research. And what I find very interesting for people who really struggle with weight is that people often blame themselves and blame their lack of willpower, which I don't think 70 million people have lack of willpower. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but as we've discovered over the last 30 years is all these hormones that actually tell the brain all these things going on. And people think it's all their own psychology when there's a very strong physiology, a really strong aspect of biology that's making these things happen. And so I really like to integrate both endocrine knowledge, but in working with patients and helping them really work with the stigma of having extra weight. I do a lot of research and working with medications to try to help people, et cetera. So endocrinology is just really interesting. It's interesting how hormones affect how we think about things and how we perceive things. So I just found it fascinating. That's all. So specifically with like diabetes, do you have more type twos or more type ones? In my clinic, I have more type twos. Okay. Uh, because my clinic is very much focused on weight management. However, I do have some type ones because, as you know, management of insulin can be rough for some people and they can actually get weight gain when they're using insulin. Yeah. And so, you know, I have, I have patients that were like we say, they're almost like type two plus type one because they need so much insulin they become insulin resistant Me. and they gain weight. And as they gain weight, it's harder to lose weight, this but was they mean. still are dependent on insulin. Yes. Exactly. I was the insulin resistant and everybody was like, I can eat pizza and take insulin and it works. And I was like, well, I can't even eat a blueberry and take insulin. And I, they put me on metformin because they thought it would be the key, like figure out my insulin resistance right, to see if it would help. Yeah. I was yeah. gaining weight, could not lose weight was eating low carb diet. And so then I finally found the magic in the plant-based diet with the fat, how it blocks the insulin. But that was me. And so it's crazy because I think like insulin resistance, yeah, is such a bigger thing too for type ones, especially. But what is what normally is your like number one treatment method for type twos? Do you like to go directly kind of with the medication route depending? No, I think it really depends. So, so much of what you do when you work with someone, you really have to adapt to whatever the individual situation is, right? You got to take a person's context Mm -hmm. into account. So it depends. I have some people who are 100 pounds overweight Mm -hmm. and I have some people who are 30 pounds overweight. Obviously, someone who's 100 pounds overweight, it's not going to be so easy to move, right? I can't just say, go take a walk 30 minutes a day, blah, blah, blah. Many of my patients 
are afraid to walk because they're afraid they'll fall and they won't be able to get up. They're afraid they'll have a heart attack, et cetera. So we really just try to integrate a multidisciplinary program and sort of assessing a person's diet. Some people are different. Some people cook. That's not a problem. I have some people that are vegetarian that actually gain weight because of the type and style of vegetarian approach that they do. There's so many different diets, you have to adapt the diet. But generally, I would say we try to be very sensible. And, you know, the Mediterranean diet is probably the, well, is the only diet that shows improved cardiovascular risk. So we probably do a Mediterranean diet-ish version for people. Some people sometimes use meal replacements because they need to lose weight and need to improve their insulin sensitivity and not because there's some magic to it, but because it helps them think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, they they can think about one meal and use meal replacements for the rest. So you have to adapt. You can use medicines for maintenance. Um, Sometimes medicine just really helps people start going. Like they just keep hitting the wall and they get really hungry. And medication can help with the hunger, which then allows them to do all the things they've been trying to do all along. So we just have to adapt to people. I'm, I'm very flexible. Dr. Rubino, could you explain a little bit about the Mediterranean diet for those listening that might not know what that is? Yeah, so it's a diet that's based on complex carbohydrates. It's also based on lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, more oils like olive oil, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated oils, and then really lean meats like lean fish lean chicken, et cetera. So it's a way of decreasing fat to more of the good fats that are better for your cholesterol, better for inflammation. It's also thought to be sort of an anti-inflammatory diet. Does that help? Yeah, I was just kind of wondering, how about your success stories? How how many people have come to you and say, okay, Dr. Rubino's method is the one that I want to go with? (laughs) I don't know that it's just a method. I will say this. Number one, we really help people change the way they think about their life and really improve their quality of life and their approach to their life. We have a lot of psychological support as well. I have people who have lost anywhere from 30 pounds to 130 pounds. The trick is sustaining it. It's really hard work and working with it. But I, you know, I'm very flexible and I adapt. I don't have a magic. There is no magic. We have to work with science, but we have to work with a given individual. Sorry, Toby, I don't have a magic. <laughs> no, it's okay. We're trying to get the magic. Yeah. Get your magic and then on your way you go. Did you know that family members of type 1 diabetics have a 15 times greater risk to develop type 1 diabetes than the general population? I didn't either until I found TrialNet. Now my sister's getting tested so that we can see if she's at risk for type 1 diabetes using a simple at-home test kit that TrialNet sends right to your door. You can either ship it back or do the risk screening test at a TrialNet site located throughout North America or any local Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp lab. Crazy that this service is free, right? If you are found to be at risk, TrialNet can offer you an opportunity to join a prevention study, testing ways to slow or even stop the development of type 1 diabetes. For people taking part in T1D research, the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis at diagnosis drops from 30% to less than 3%. I may be thankful for my diabetes, but I want to make sure my family is cared for in the way I was in my diagnosis or even stop the development of diabetes entirely. Check out TrialNet now at www.trialnet.org and find out if you're eligible for a free screening test kit today. DieStrong is an online telehealth platform that connects you to medical and holistic professionals to help you manage your diabetes. Find registered dietitians, nutritionists, certified diabetes educators, and more without the hassle of having to go into a doctor's office. Wait, 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 wait. You mean a lazy bum like me can have appointments right from my computer? Sign me up. That's right, Doby. And this week, our listeners can use promo code JMT25 for 25% off their first visit. Yeah, don't try to cheat and go to JMT26 because you're not going to get 26. It's 25. Go to www.diastronghealth.com. That's www.diastronghealth.com. We are back. Just by type. We're thrilled that you're listening to us. Sammy Parker, type one. My name is Toby Maxwell, type two. Uh, our special guest today, Dr. Domenica Rubino. Sammy, you got any questions? Uh, there's so many to ask Dr. Rubino. I don't know where to go. Well, I have two questions. One's a serious one and one's a funny one. So the funny one, I think we should start. I, (laughs) we need to have the discussion. Is it diabetes or diabetes? Oh, for goodness sake. Is it tomato or tomato? It doesn't matter, does it? Diabetes. I probably say it different ways, different times, actually. I don't know. I'll start paying attention. What do I say? Diabetes. Diabetes. I think I say diabetes, but you know, it probably is where you're from. It's true. At least it's not cancer. Yeah. Everybody pronounces cancer. We don't want that. We'll take diabetes, diabetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, my real question. Okay, real question. 
<laughs> that's always the like, just, I'm always like, is it diabetes or diabetes? Real question. Pre-diabetes. Yes. Serious issue. People don't know about it. I have friends that I'm like, oh my gosh, they're totally going to be pre-diabetic. But I, if they're listening, which hopefully they are, can you shed some light on pre-diabetes, what it is and how to prevent it? So... First of all, it's important to realize that in and of itself, prediabetes increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. A lot of people do not know that. They kind of think it's just borderline. Maybe, I'm not sure what people mean by borderline. A lot of times people think borderline means you're in the clear. It's just someone said, hey, you got to think about it. But actually, that's not true. So important information to understand is, first of all, many people do not realize they have prediabetes. Prediabetes is a state where your body starts to need to make more insulin to keep the blood sugars in a normal range. So it's before type 2 diabetes. However, it's diagnosed, we have a range of blood sugars that we consider prediabetes. And the A1C can be anywhere between 5.7 and 6.4. That puts you in the pre-diabetes category. Weight loss is the most important thing and exercise to try to move you from pre-diabetes to normal blood sugar. Every year, just under, well, 4 to 9%, 5 to 10%, wherever you look at it, people convert from pre-diabetes to having type 2 diabetes. The sooner you can act on it, the better to shift you over. I would say in my clinic, probably 40 to 50% of people have prediabetes and about 80% never knew it. They were told they had borderline or whatever. Very, very common to have been told you have borderline diabetes or prediabetes for about five years or so. And the next thing you know, you have type 2 diabetes and you don't realize it. Are there a lot of symptoms with it? The only thing I can say is prediabetes might come with a lot of fatigue. And one of the early diagnoses I see with type 2 diabetes is just fatigue. I don't necessarily see the increased thirst and the increased urination until you are so far, your blood sugars are, are so far gone. We see early things. We see early neuropathy. I see very commonly in prediabetes, I see early decreased sensation in a person's foot. I have a question as far as the neuropathy goes. Yeah. How would you best explain that to people, like the feeling, so that they can be kind of aware of it? So the first thing is your doctor should be checking that. Sad to say, but when I do a physical exam on people, and a lot of times I'm checking for vibratory sensation and filament sensation, mm -hmm. they say, what are you doing? <laughs> right? I've never had that before. What is that? So, so first of all, you should ask your doctor to check your sensation in your feet and you want to check vibratory sensation. And how do they do that? There's a vibratory hammer, actually, that you put it on the end of the bone on the toe or on the ankle, and you feel it. And when it, you don't feel it anymore, you tell the doctor. And so people who have vibratory loss, it actually, they're not as sensitive as somebody without that vibratory sensation. So we see okay. early loss. Now, for symptoms for someone, if it's progressed a bit, you can have tingling, uh, in your feet, sometimes it can feel kind of numb. Because I, I get the numb, well, it's hard because my mom gets it, but she's not diabetic at all. Yeah. So, but I'll like, if I'm working out for like an hour or longer, I get like, or my toes just go a little numb. But I'm always like, is that from diabetes or genetics? My mom gets that. Yeah. You know? And for you with exercise, it may be that there's a little compression on the nerve and you may want to really make sure that you get wider shoes. Got it. So your, your toes have more room okay, or that the socks give you room, et cetera. Some people get that and they can, it's more of a, more of a structural thing of pushing and Got compression. It. So people should be careful of their shoes. They should be careful of what they wear on their feet. You need to protect your feet. You need to be careful of things like pedicures and stuff like that, especially if you have diabetes yeah. because your risk for infection is much greater. Okay, Dr. Rubino, if there's one tip that you could give somebody that might be uh, pre-diabetic, or you diabetic at all, just the one one main thing that they can do for their health. Because I mean, nobody wants to go to the hospital. Nobody wants to hear that that word. No matter how you pronounce it, it's a big, ugly, nasty disease. Yeah. What can we do? And coming from an endocrinologist to hopefully make the visit with you when they have it easier. Eat better, move more. I don't know about one word, Toby. So I think it's self-care. And I think it's really composed of several things. One is you got to get better sleep. Okay. All right. Because a lot of people don't sleep. And if you have problems with sleep apnea or something like that, you need to get your sleep assessed and you need to sleep. You need to exercise in some fashion. You need to be active. You cannot be sedentary. We can talk about that in a second if you want to. Choose wisely the foods you eat. 
be careful how you eat. If you have trouble with hunger, craving, any of that kind of stuff, then seek out someone to help you with that. But you really got to look at how do I care for myself and probably deal with stress. Recognize the role that stress is playing in your life and seek out help if you need it. Um, Because that kind of combination, it really is about self-care. I believe. Boy, I don't know what you're talking about. In the modern world, I don't see anybody stressed out and anybody <laughs> losing any sleep. I don't know. You're just talking from... Not Udo. Dobie, never. No, I know. We should all live in California. No, it is. <laughs> no matter where you live. Seriously. I mean, you could you think about it in theory. Theory and reality are two different things. I'm going to eat great and I'm going to... And then, you know, you stress on the way to work, you go through a drive through window and next thing you know, you're drinking insulin by the gallon. No, and I think this is what I would say, Dobie. I think you need to pick one thing, one thing, just one thing to start with. Mm -hmm. Start with something that you can do for 10 minutes, even five minutes, all right? Mm -hmm. Um, You you can't do all of it at once. Some people are better at starting some kind of activity. Some people are better at changing their food. Some people are better at trying to follow up on their sleep or whatnot. You got to kind of be conscious of what is the thing that you might be able to try. And when you do one thing, it often can help another. But start small. Everyone has huge goals and they're not realistic. I have people who come in and say, okay, I want to lose 130 pounds. I'm like, really? Like, I mean, <laughs> get a divorce. And I don't mean I can't help you get a divorce. Exactly. You know, yeah, I just, wanted yeah, to do okay. that. I wanted to have an ad, lose the weight, <laughs> lose the spouse. Because, you know, sometimes you do have relationship issues and dysfunctional issues <laughs> that can contribute to weight because it's how you're managing, no, totally. right? Or people, I love that. It would have been probably a very tasteless ad, but um, <laughs> um they go and do an endocrinologist, come out, all right, I think I'm getting a divorce. <laughs> How did that work? He just lost 138 pounds. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Rubina, don't you think also we're going to wrap it up here real quick, but uh, ethnicity too, I think. And I don't mean- Absolutely. But I think with the cultures that people have, their diet, their exercise, even their sleep habits and patterns Correct. are mm-hmm. different. Correct. So yes, cultural things are different, just as you described. Also, there are biological cultural differences, right? So Asians are at a much greater risk of developing diabetes and prediabetes at lower weights, all right? Mm, okay. Caucasians can gain a lot more before they actually get prediabetes compared to Asians. Got it. Mm-hmm. So when Asians have a BMI of 23, they're at greater risk, for example. People of color, Hispanics, Black Americans, those are at, they are at increased risk too. And different people are at different risk for cardiometabolic associations with diabetes as well. And then it also depends on your demographic. Where do you live? What's your mm-hmm. economic situation? Yeah. Et cetera. So yeah, there are so many different factors that impact it. And you know, you need to start kind of looking at what can I do for my particular culture. Sammy, once again, more information than should be had in one episode was had today. Uh, thanks to Dr. Rubino for being here. This is fascinating once again. Yes. Okay. Well, first off, I want to say thank you too for coming on. But um, oh, sure. So question of the pod. And please, again, you guys, rate, review, subscribe, give us a five-star rating so we can get the diabetes community all together and have everybody being educated, entertained, and engaged. But the question of the pod, Dr. Rubino, would you be so amazing to ask it, please? Sure. What is your biggest fear of having diabetes? Diabetes. All right, Dobie, answer this one. The biggest fear, yes. having Dr. Rubino send me the bill. Oh, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. Comedy is what I do. I know. No, I, honestly, truly, the complications, and I know this sounds corny, but losing my eyesight. Because mm-hmm. as a kid, I was heard, we had a lady in, in our neighborhood and she had diabetes and she lost her eyesight. And that scared me. When I heard I had it, I'm thinking, am I going to go blind? That's one of the first things I thought of. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Honestly, that's definitely one of mine. But the other one is, um, I would either say that, but honestly, the amp- amputation, that that really hits me. I'm like, ooh, I would like to keep all my extremities. Yeah, that one freaks me out. Dr. Rubino, there was a, a rather famous comedian named Vic Dunlop. He was on TV a lot in the 70s and 80s, and I got to be pretty good friends with him. And he had uh, type 1 very badly. Mm-hmm. And in his final years, he had a leg amputated. And he said, it doesn't sound like a big thing mm-hmm. until it happens to you. Yeah. And he was never the same after that. Yeah. It took part of his soul yeah. when that happened. Yeah. He passed away shortly after that. I mean, the lucky thing is, though, is that our medical knowledge and treatment for diabetes, both one and two, is so much better and so much greater. And we yeah. have so many different medications. We're in a much better situation than they were in the 80s. Medicine has improved tremendously on all these fronts amputation, eyes, kidney, heart. And so it's important to remember that we're all progressing with this, yeah. right? 
But yes, you're right. Anything like that can be incredibly devastating psychologically. So please answer that question of the pod. And you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok at just my type pod underscore Facebook, just my type pod. And our hashtag is just my type pod. Dr. Rubino, thanks for being with us. We're going to have you back again. Oh, it's great. It was great fun. I'm happy to do it. Yeah, thank Appreciate you so it. much. Beautiful. Take good care, We're going to put diabetes and fun in the same. We'll talk to you again. Sammy, put a lid on it, sister. Say la vie, baby. This is the Just My Type podcast.